First World War Tech, Zeppelins. When a German aristocrat, Brigadier General Ferdinand Zeppelin, retired from the army in 1891, he devoted himself to the study of aeronautics. His proposals to the government for a lighter-than-air flying machine were rejected in 1894, but nevertheless, he would invest all his money into a company producing airships. By 1898, Zeppelin had constructed his first airship. The foundation of the airship were in its hydrogen-filled gas bags, carried inside a steel skeleton. It weighed 12 tons and contained 400,000 cubic feet of hydrogen and was driven by propellers connected to a pair of 15-horsepower Daimler engines. When the Zeppelin LZ made its flight on July 2, 1900, the German government decided to fund the project. In March 1909, the German army purchased the Zeppelin Z1. These Zeppelins could reach a maximum speed of 136 kilometers per hour and reach a height of 4,250 meters. They were armed with five machine guns and could carry 2,000 kilograms or 4,400 pounds of bombs. At the start of the war, Zeppelins were used in bombing raids. A Zeppelin was used to bomb Liege in Belgium on 6 August 1914 but had to make an emergency landing after encountering Belgian artillery fire. Over the next few weeks, three more Zeppelins were destroyed by ground forces. While the Zeppelins were an easy target to hit, the Germans continued to use them for attacks on France. In January 1915, two Zeppelin naval airships flew over the English coast, bombing Great Yarmouth and Kings Lynn. Zeppelins would commence a bombing raid on London on May 31, 1915, killing 28 people and injuring 60 more. Zeppelins were used at the Battle of Verdun in 1916, with four being brought down by ground fire, bringing an end to their use on the Western Front. They continued to be used to attack the British home front, but British fighter pilots and anti-aircraft gunners became efficient at taking them down. 115 Zeppelins were used by the German military, with 77 destroyed or damaged beyond repair. After the war, Zeppelins were used for civilian transport. Antonov AN-225 Maria, the largest plane in the world, 1988 to present day. On the 24th of February, 2022, the Russian President Vladimir Putin declared war on Ukraine. Nearly all of the Western powers and its many allies saw this as an unprovoked Russian invasion of a democratic and independent nation. Whereas Putin claimed Russia was aiming to liberate the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics in the east of Ukraine from a supposedly corrupt and dictatorial government in the capital, Kyiv. Putin also demanded Ukraine's permanent exclusion from the West's military alliance, NATO, seeing the expansion of the alliance to its borders as a threat, while furthermore seriously questioning the legitimacy of Ukraine's autonomy from Russia. Russia has gained strong support for this action from both Belarus and Syria. On the first day of the conflict, Russian paratroopers attacked Hostomel Airfield, a former Soviet Union secret test facility, located only 20 kilometers or 12 miles from Kyiv. It was later captured to act as a landing pad for further reinforcements by air. During the intense fighting, an Antonov AN-225 Maria cargo plane that was at the airfield undergoing routine maintenance was hit and almost completely destroyed. With the loss of this aircraft, a truly unique piece of aviation history was lost, as it was the only one of its kind ever built. It was originally conceived in 1983 to carry the impossible at the time, to bring the Soviet Union's Buran space shuttle and core parts of the Soviet Energia rocket carrier from Moscow to Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. This was considered to be a cheaper alternative than to finance a freeway from Moscow to Baikonur. The US and the USSR had been locked in a space race to outperform the other ever since the first satellite Sputnik was launched on October 4, 1957. The Buran space shuttle therefore had been the rival to the US space shuttle. There were also plans for the Maria's use as an airborne launch platform for space planes, such as the NPO Molnia's MOX. All the Maria would need to do was reach a height of 10 kilometers in the sky, and the aircraft on its back could use 90% less of its energy to reach space than from on the ground. In mid-1984, only after a year of planning, a basic design model for this aircraft was finalized by Soviet engineers. 
It was approved by chief designer Petro Balabuyev of the Antonov Design Bureau in Kyiv and was given the green light by the Soviet government in 1987. Its official name is Mriya, which means dream in Ukrainian, and is also named the AN-225 after Oleg Antonov, founder of the Antonov Design Bureau. NATO codenamed the plane as Cossack, but this name is seldom used when referring to the aircraft. The Mriya first flew on December 21, 1988, only a month after the Baran's inaugural debut. And on March 22, 1989, the Mriya broke 100 aviation records, smashing the previous maximum takeoff weight held by the Boeing 747-400 by 245,000 pounds, or 111 metric tons. In May, after conducting tests at the Baikul Nur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the plane would fly the 2,400 kilometers back to Kyiv in 4 hours 27 minutes, despite weighing 1.2 million pounds, or 560 metric tons, while carrying the Buran. Two months later, it would fly for three and a half hours to be shown off at the 38th Paris Air Show. Flown into Le Bourget in Paris, spectators were stunned not only by its Goliath's size, but also because it was allowed to fly in the rain, something the US Space Shuttle Orbiter would have never been permitted. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, however, the Buran Space Shuttle project would need to be abandoned, as well as any dreams of a second completed AN-225, as funding for such ambitious projects dried up. The final flight with the Mriya and the Buran would occur on April 12, 1991, to mark the 30th anniversary of the first manned flight to space by Yuri Gagarin. In 1994, the Mriya, after 339 flights and 671 hours in the air, found itself too expensive to be maintained, and was consequently grounded and partially dismantled to upgrade its predecessor, the AN-124 Ruslan. The Mriya therefore never had the opportunity to fly any parts of the Energia rocket or to launch any eager space planes into the cosmos. But a few years later, a niche emerged in the commercial market for a heavy lift aircraft to cater for supersized and ultra heavy cargo. As a result, in September 1999, the Antonov Design Bureau's successor and the engine manufacturer Motor Sich invested in a commercialized version of the Mriya. In May 2001, the aircraft was restored into service and was operated by Antonov Airlines. Antonov Airlines is a Ukrainian international charter airline which specializes in oversized cargo. Everything about the Mriya was huge and impressive. It was over 275 feet or 84 meters long with a wingspan of 290 feet or 88.4 meters. This is a wingspan over double the distance of the Wright brothers' first motorized flight and towering over all other aircraft at a height of 81 feet or 25 meters, it was as tall as a six-story building. To control this monster of an aircraft, it took a crew of six people, a pilot, a co-pilot, two flight engineers, a navigator, and a radio operator. The Maria's colossal airframe was powered by six enormous Progress D-18T turbofan engines, two more than the previous Ruslan model, each capable of producing 51,000 pounds or 24,000 kilograms of thrust. The turbine inlet temperature of these engines was about 2,420 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,327 degrees Celsius, which was hot enough to melt normal steel. Therefore, special superheat-resistant alloys had to be used in the construction of the turbofans and certain parts of the engines. After undergoing modifications in 2001, it could carry an incredible 560,000 pounds or 253 metric tons of cargo internally, along with being able to carry externally an additional up to 440,000 pounds or 200 metric tons of outsized cargo, up to 230 feet or 70 meters long. All this allowed for it to have a maximum takeoff weight of about 1.4 million pounds or 640 metric tons but this meant that it had to have an extremely heavy-duty landing gear system consisting of 32 high-impact wheels and a reinforced lower fuselage in order to be able to survive the stresses of such a high-impact landing. Already in September 2001, it flew four battle tanks to reach the world record-breaking 560,000 pounds or 253 metric tons of cargo at the 44th Paris Air Show. On August 11, 2009, lifting a 413,000-pound or 187-metric ton generator, the Mriya achieved a world record for the heaviest single piece of cargo at Frankfurt Hahn Airport. 
Despite having cost around $30,000 an hour to hire, it had proved popular with customers, as it had many unique features like having a large ramp entrance at both the front and the back, and a split tail configuration. It made it particularly well suited for extra long cargo. In its 33-year-long career as a freight carrier, it had shouldered numerous cargo that other aircraft could have never had any hope of carrying, like two entire green energy tram carriages from China to Turkey, or two giant wind turbine blades from China to Denmark. Its use in humanitarian aid included transporting bulldozers and tractors to Haiti after the devastating 2010 earthquake, lifting vehicles to Japan after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster, as well as shipping over 100 metric tons of medicine and personal protective equipment like masks from China to Germany, Poland, France, and America in 2020. And although it's clear that the aircraft was destroyed, just a week after its destruction, a major Ukraine arms manufacturer is demanding $3 billion from the Russian Federation in order to restore the Mriya and bring it back into service, a task it says will take five years. Given the aircraft's huge contribution to the world, there may still be hope left for the dream. Messerschmitt Me-262 German jet fighter, World War II. Nazi Germany was a strong supporter of jet technology and developed the first turbojet-powered aircraft called the Heinkel HE-178, which flew in 1939, only days before the German invasion of Poland. The Messerschmitt Me-262 was not the first fighter jet in World War II. This was the Heinkel HE-280, although it would emerge several months before the British Gloucester Meteor. Nevertheless, the Me-262 was an advanced design in the war that signaled the dawning of the jet age. It was sleek in appearance with swept wings and a powerful armament. Under secret development for several years as Project 1065, before the war had even started, the Me-262 prototype was ready in 1940, with a Junkers Jumo 210 piston engine turning a propeller because of delays in the intended turbojets. The first test flight of the Me-262 V-1 was on April 18, 1941. On July 18, 1942, the Me-262, now in its third prototype phase, flew for the first time with turbojets. Its power plant were two Junkers Jumo 004 turbojets. While these were better than the previously tested BMW 003 engines, they had a short operational lifespan of just 20 to 25 hours due to shortages of heat-resistant materials. The jet had a maximum speed of 900 km per hour, or 559 miles per hour, and would be difficult to maneuver for the inexperienced pilots training with this new machine. The Me-262 impressed many, including the famous German air ace Adolf Galland and Adolf Hitler, who insisted that it should be a bomber rather than a fighter. Some of the major variants were the Hunter, nicknamed the Swallow, the Bomber, nicknamed the Stormbird, and an experimental two-seater night fighter. In its bomber role, it was armed with two 250-kilogram bombs, but with no bomb sights, targeting accuracy was difficult. As a fighter, and therefore without the weight of bombs, it was deadly against Allied aircraft. It was armed with four 30-millimeter Mk-108 cannons. The jet could also be fitted with 24 R-4M rockets, which could take down a B-17 bomber with ease. In less than a year of operational service, the Me-262 had proven that it was an effective, innovative weapon against the Allied bombers and their escorts. The jet fighter first saw action in the summer of 1944. In August, the first Me-262, lost to the enemy, was shot down by a P-47 Thunderbolt. The unit JV-44, commanded by General Adolf Galland, saw much success against enemy bombers with a 4 to 1 kill ratio. While it was much faster than the P-51 Mustang, it was less maneuverable, which U.S. pilots took advantage of when the Me-262 was making turns. It would also be vulnerable to enemy aircraft during takeoff and landing on runways. For Germany, the Me-262 came into the war too late. Allied bombing made production difficult, and only 1,433 total Me-262s would be built. After the war, Czechoslovakia also produced and flew their own Me-262s. The F-35, a legend in the making. 1995 to the present day, 2022. 
The Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II aircraft is a major American-led collaborative military project whose aim is to provide the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marines, along with its allies, with an affordable fifth-generation multi-role fighter aircraft, replacing older existing designs and standardizing the Air Force arsenal. It's planned to build them in huge numbers, and it's intended to be the NATO and Western world's leading combat aircraft for the next 50 years. It's thought to be one of the largest and most expensive military aviation projects in history, and it's estimated that the acquisition cost alone for all the F-35s that will potentially be ordered could easily reach over $400 billion. This doesn't include the billions spent on its research and development. The aircraft also uses some research and technology from previous U.S. secret projects, primarily the F-22 Raptor aircraft. And interestingly, it also draws on some of the design concepts of the VTOL nozzle duct from the 1970s failed futuristic Convair Model 200 aircraft project. Work on the project started as far back as 1995 with the introduction of the Joint Strike Fighter program, a joint venture of several departments of defense and previous programs. Two designs were competing at this stage, the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed Martin X-35, with the latter winning the competition. The X-35 was a concept demonstrator aircraft that had its first flight in October 2000, and by the next year it had already managed to take off, achieve supersonic speed, and land vertically. It had outperformed the Boeing X-32 and became a foundation for the F-35 project that would follow. After a period of intense testing, Lockheed Martin became the prime contractor for the entire project, supported by Northrop Grumman and BAE Systems. They then started to develop the slightly larger F-35 model, a high-tech single-seater multi-role all-weather combat aircraft. It had a highly capable engine and was truly an advanced stealthy design, and therefore began the lengthy and complex process of system integration. The key backer of the project is the United States, with the United Kingdom becoming a major investor. Other countries who have given significant financial backing to the project includes Italy, the Netherlands, Turkey, Australia, Norway, Denmark, and Canada, with further commitment and participation from Israel, Singapore, Belgium, Finland, Poland, Japan, and South Korea. Though in 2019, Turkey was dropped from the project due to security concerns. It was decided early on to produce three different versions of the F-35, but to still maintain a high degree of compatibility between them all. This was in order to keep the production costs down and for ease of maintenance once they were in service. Initially, there would be the F-35A. This was to be the standard version and would be purely land-based. It could only be used on conventional runways and is the cheapest of the three versions. It's also the only one with a built-in internal gun a GAU-12 Equalizer 25mm rotary cannon. Secondly, there's the F-35B, which has a short takeoff and vertical landing ability. This allows it to be deployed at non-runway sites and could also be used in a limited capacity on board aircraft carriers. And thirdly, there's the F-35C, a dedicated carrier-based version. This also has short takeoff ability, but can also perform a vertical takeoff and landing. It has a much larger wing that is also foldable, a reinforced landing gear, and an arrestor hook, all of which are designed to help the aircraft to operate on board an aircraft carrier. With such a complex and ambitious design that has so many different demands put on it, it was inevitable that there would be delays and cost overruns. For instance, early on in the project, all three versions were becoming massively overweight. This became a major problem as it was causing a significant drop in the F-35's performance, especially in the B and C versions. It wasn't finally resolved until September 2004, after a dramatic weight reduction program was introduced. This added an additional cost of $6.2 billion to the project and resulted in an 18-month delay in the F-35 development schedule. Other problems have included numerous software issues, as well as the discovery of premature cracking in the F-35B airframes and an unreliable arrestor hook system on the F-35C. There was some confusion with the orders placed by participant countries, like in the case of the UK government, who initially ordered the F-35C version for their new aircraft carriers. Then in 2012, they changed their order to the F-35B version, 
only to reconsider a short time later and change their order back to the C version. But they later dismissed this idea again and stayed with going for the B version. Understandably, with all these various issues going on and the fact that over 300,000 parts were required to produce an F-35, the in-service date would slip back from 2010 to 2015. Nevertheless, what eventually ended up being produced was a cutting-edge aircraft with a very impressive performance. There were two particular features that made the F-35 outstanding. The first is its stealth ability. It has an incredibly low radar signature. This is helped by it being coated in a radar absorbent material. As well as this, its weapons can be carried in an internal weapons bay. It also has a very low infrared signature, and its shape makes it very hard to spot visually. Though the engine noise is still an issue with the F-35, with it being on a similar decibel level as the much older F-16 Falcon fighter design. Its second important feature is its ability to be able to supercruise for extended periods. This is where the aircraft can go considerably faster without using its afterburner, and this makes it harder to spot, uses far less fuel and is much more difficult to hit with infrared missiles. It also has cutting-edge sensors and avionics that gives the F-35's pilot a high level of situational awareness when in combat. The F-35 also has a highly capable weapon platform that can carry a sizable weapon load in its internal bay, as well as on its six outer hardpoints, though using the latter makes the aircraft far less stealthy. It also has an impressive arsenal of weaponry at its disposal. For instance, in the air-to-air -air environment, it can use a multitude of the very latest air combat missiles, like the high-speed AIM-120. This is an advanced all-weather radar-guided missile that can travel at around 3,000 miles per hour, which is nearly a mile every second, and depending on the version, it can have a range of up to 95 miles. The F-35 can also use the AIM-9X short-range infrared dogfighting missile. This is an all-aspect missile and can even be fired before it's locked on to its target, being then directed towards a target, allowing it to lock on using its own built-in infrared sensor. In ground attack mode, it can use a wide variety of deadly and sophisticated air-to-surface or anti-ship missiles, as well as the traditional laser-guided bombs. All of this can be linked up to the pilot's advanced $400,000 helmet, and though these have not been without their problems and setbacks, they have the potential to be a truly remarkable piece of equipment. With six eyeball cameras that are dotted around the outer skin of the F-35, this gives the pilot a true 360-degree view around the aircraft. It's also claimed that the F-35 is far easier to maintain than the F-22, which was a complete and utter logistical nightmare to service. Though there have been concerns about the aircraft's many systems underperforming, being unreliable and vulnerable to electronic attacks. In 2009, the average cost of an F-35A was $112 million, though by 2020 the manufacturers had finally gotten the cost overruns under control and were at least benefiting from the savings of mass production. So, with over 500 F-35s having now been delivered, the average price of one has been reduced to $91 million. By 2022, most of the project's customers had received some of their orders or were due them very soon. Currently, it's planned to produce about 3,100 of these aircraft, with the production lines projected to stay open until the 2050s, but this figure's constantly under review. It's very likely to change in the near future, as budgets and political priorities change, as well as possible new customers coming on board from countries such as Switzerland and the United Arab Emirates. But there are still relatively few fifth-generation aircraft in service in the world today, and they are untested in battle. So far, the F-35 has been involved in some combat operations, like in September 2018 when one attacked a Taliban target in Afghanistan. And in 2019, it was reported that the British RAF F-35s carried out several reconnaissance missions in combat zones over Iraq and Syria. Both of these operations were carried out without loss or incident. The Israeli Air Force successfully intercepted two Iranian drones in March of 2021, which were carrying weapons into the Gaza Strip, the first operational interception and elimination of this type of aircraft. In May 2021, the F-35s took part in Operation Guardian of the Walls, attacking launch pads and positions of multiple rocket launchers belonging to Hamas. 
To date, the F-35 did not take part in dogfights or any other combat between fighters. Therefore, we have yet to find out whether all of this expensive technology and ambitious design concept will actually pay off against actual enemy aircraft or a dedicated air defense network. Worryingly, there are already concerns in allied military circles that, despite future upgrades, the F-35's stealth ability might be seriously compromised within the next 10 years by newly emerging technology. Shark Face Nose Art on Military Planes 1916 to the Present Day During World War I, the newly invented airplane became a most deadly and versatile killing machine, soon dominating the skies above the battlefields of Europe. Halfway through the war, elaborate color schemes started to appear on many aircraft. Most were for the practical purpose of camouflage, but some were designed to simply impress and exert the pilot's individuality. Before the war, the first recorded example of aircraft nose art was a painting of a sea monster on an Italian seaplane in 1913 as a form of advertisement and intimidation during air races. During the war, nose art was still rare, but nevertheless there were still some notable exceptions. In an attempt to look more intimidating, several Roland C-2 aircraft had a crude, snarling, shark-type mouth with sharp teeth painted on their noses by German pilots. It is believed that this was an attempt to try and scare off Allied fighters by looking as fearsome as possible. The Roland C-2 was designed to perform artillery spotting, short-range reconnaissance, and photography in support of a frontline infantry division. C-2s began to be used in Flyga Abitalung units for reconnaissance and escort duties by the beginning of 1916. Because of its performance characteristics, it was often used as a strategic reconnaissance plane, flying deep into enemy territory. Later, when the Allies introduced faster fighting planes, Rolands were used for close support and reconnaissance, slowly withdrawing from the front line until June of 1917, when they were transferred into training schools. Later during the interwar years of the 1920s and 30s, canvas and wooden aircraft gave way to airplanes that were constructed of steel and aluminum. It was all about highly polished surfaces, national insignia, and squadron markings. But with the coming of World War II, this quickly gave way to the practical need once more to camouflage aircraft. During this period emerged a more widespread usage among certain units of the shark face design. The shark face was made famous early in the war by the legendary 1st American Volunteer Group who were nicknamed the Flying Tigers. Their three squadrons flew the new Curtis P-40 Kitty Hawks for the Chinese government against the invading Japanese. These aircraft were manned by American pilots who snuck into the region as tourists because America was not officially at war with Japan at the time. They later famously had shark mouths painted onto their planes, which looked particularly impressive as the P-40 had a very large air intake at the front to put it on. It also suited the fierce and aggressive combat reputation of these pilots, as well as the maverick nature of this highly independent unit. Though the idea was not their own, their inspiration had come after seeing a photograph of a P-40 of the number 112 Squadron RAF in North Africa painted in such a way, who in turn had been inspired after seeing the German Luftwaffe ZG-76, whose twin-engine Messerschmitt Bf-110s were painted like this. The ZG-76 was always in the thick of the fighting, such as in the Polish and Norwegian campaigns, as well as the battle for the Netherlands, Belgium, Britain, and France. So this German fighter-bomber squadron had wanted to revive the snarling monster shark teeth tradition that was first used in World War I by the Roland bomber units in order to reflect their bravery in battle. Few other units during the war officially adopted the shark mouth, but nevertheless it could be sometimes found on individual aircraft in most major air forces. One strange example was on a P-51 Mustang that was forced to land at a Japanese-held airfield near the end of World War II after being hit by enemy gunfire. So impressed were the Japanese with the shark mouth painting on the front of the aircraft that they kept the design on along with their freshly painted roundels while they tested the Mustang to see how good it really was in a series of mock dogfights. The shark mouth motif was to appear in large numbers on the American side during the Vietnam War of the 1960s, not just on airplanes but also on other military vehicles like attack boats and helicopters. The logic was that the enemy, the North Vietnamese, who were thought to be highly superstitious, would be intimidated by such a fearsome display. And interestingly, Brazil, who had acquired a large amount of surplus P-40s after World War II, were still using them well into the 1950s and also painted the shark mouths onto these fighters. Nowadays, the shark mouth motif is rarely used, but there is one notable exception, 
and that is on the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II ground attack aircraft. This heavily armored plane with one of the most powerful guns ever mounted on an aircraft often flies at very low altitude and speed. Therefore, it must be a terrifying sight to see it appear at treetop heights, firing through its shark mouth with its incredibly powerful 30mm Avenger rotary cannon. Why were these two planes stuck together? The Heinkel HE-111Z. Weird Tech, World War II, 1941 to 1945. In early 1944, a British reconnaissance Spitfire pilot on patrol over northern France reported seeing what appeared to be two German Heinkel 111 bombers joined together as one aircraft. At first, British intelligence dismissed this as being either an optical illusion caused by a pair of enemy bombers flying together in close formation, or the pilot just having an overactive imagination. In fact, what the pilot had just seen was a Heinkel 111Z on a training flight. A few weeks later, an RAF Mosquito shot one down, along with two Gotha gliders that it was towing, finally confirming that such a bizarre aircraft did actually exist. The Heinkel 111Z had been quickly developed back in 1941 as an aircraft that would have enough power to tow the newly introduced ME321 heavy cargo glider off the ground and into the air. This new glider had been aptly named the Gigant, or the Giant. The intention was that this extra-large glider would be used in Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain planned for September 1940. But after the Battle of Britain, when the RAF managed to retain dominance of the skies over the German Luftwaffe on October 31, 1940, this idea was abandoned. It was nevertheless decided by German High Command to continue the project as it could prove useful in supplying and transporting their troops around the vast expanse of the Russian front. The ME321 was a truly gigantic aircraft with a wingspan of 180 feet or 55 meters and it could carry up to 130 soldiers or around 23 tons of supplies and equipment. This was over six times more than the standard German transport plane the Junkers Ju-52 could carry at that time and crucially, the ME321 was able to carry armored fighting vehicles, something the Ju-52 could not do. So the Germans saw the main role of the ME321 as being a transport aircraft rather than as an assault glider. But it soon became apparent that the problem with the ME321 was actually getting it off the ground. Even when using three powerful ME110C twin-engine fighter bombers to tow it into the air, it proved to be a far too dangerous and complicated operation. So the aircraft manufacturer Heinkel came up with a radical but highly practical solution. They simply joined two of their HE-111 twin-engine medium bombers together, and where they were connected added an extra engine, making five in total, giving additional power to the plane. The development of this new hybrid aircraft was quick and relatively hassle-free as it was ready to enter service in 1942. Soon, though, it became apparent that despite its engines having a combined power output of over 6,500 horsepower in total, which made it that much more powerful than the modern-day USC-130 Hercules cargo aircraft, which has a maximum of 4,700 horsepower, it was still badly underpowered when trying to take off towing a fully laden ME321 Gigant. So it was decided to add underwing-mounted Startufa, jettisonable rocket-assisted takeoff booster units that would assist the HE-111Z during takeoff and would then be released and allowed to parachute back to the ground to be refilled and reused later. The plane itself had a crew of seven and had the pilot along with the chief mechanic, radio operator, navigator, and gunner all in the port side fuselage, while the starboard fuselage housed the co-pilot, the second mechanic, and another gunner. Surprisingly, in service, it was well liked by its crews and it had an incredibly long range, in excess of 1,200 miles or about 1,900 kilometers. And this could be further extended by the use of fuel drop tanks, allowing it to stay in the air for up to 10 hours. The one major drawback with the HE-111Z's design was its poor towing speed that was barely more than 130 miles per hour, or 209 kilometers per hour, which was less than a third the speed of a US P-51 Mustang long-range fighter so it was particularly vulnerable to attacks from Allied fighters. Therefore, in its service career, it was kept as far away from the front line as possible. In 1942, it was considered being used in a possible invasion of Malta, as well as to help relieve the German 6th Army stuck in the besieged city of Stalingrad. But neither deployments were ever carried out because of its vulnerability to enemy fighters. 
Only 12 HE-111Zs were ever produced, and these were used by the Luftwaffe to support its fleet of around 200 ME-321 heavy gliders. The German Air Force had had high hopes for this variant of their tried and trusted bomber, and had planned to produce a heavy bomber version, as well as a dedicated high-altitude reconnaissance version. By 1944, the bomber version, the Z-2, had become quite a viable proposition as the Luftwaffe's latest heavy bomber, the Heinkel HE-177 Griffin, was proving to be an embarrassing failure. This was due to serious engine cooling and maintenance problems that often caused them to catch fire while in flight. The proposed Z-2 would have had a powerful 20mm cannon mounted in a turret on top of the midsections of the fuselages as well as being able to carry the new Henschel HS-293 anti-ship radio control guided missiles. The Z-3 reconnaissance version would have such a long range that in theory it should have been able to reach New York from German-controlled air bases in France. But any chances of these variants being deployed any further was dashed later in 1944, when Hitler decided that all bomber production was to cease, so that the factories could concentrate on producing more fighter aircraft. This was a futile attempt to try to stem the many massive Allied air raids that were destroying industrial installations in Germany at the time. None of the Heinkel HE-111 aircraft survived the war, but the twin aircraft concept did live on when the Americans successfully developed a twin Mustang aircraft called the North American F-82. 262 of these radar-equipped aircraft were produced, and they were in service with the United States Air Force from 1946 to 1953. The ME-321 was eventually developed into the ME-323, which had six engines, therefore eliminating the need for the tug aircraft to get them airborne. The Wright Brothers, the first successful airplane, 1903. Wilbur Wright was born on April 16, 1867, in Millville, Indiana and Orville Wright was born on August 19, 1871, in Dayton, Ohio. Both brothers were pioneers, credited with inventing the first airplane. In late 1901, the Wright brothers had gathered the aerodynamic data they needed to build a successful flying machine, and in 1902, the Wright brothers had built their latest glider based on this data. They had identified a wing shape that was efficient, producing the expected lift and engineered controls that were responsive. The glider would also use a trailing rudder for yaw, therefore enabling the Wright brothers to navigate in the air in all three dimensions. Following this success, the next stage for the brothers was powered flight. No manufacturers could provide an engine light enough and powerful enough for their needs, so the brothers had to design and build their own. The flyer was designed in a biplane configuration, with a wooden airframe and a wingspan of 12.3 meters, or 40 feet 4 inches. The pilot flew on his stomach on the lower wing, steering by moving a cradle attached to his hips. This cradle pulled wires which warped the wings and turned the rudder. The Wright Flyer 1, based on the previous glider, was set up near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, in the United States of America on December 17, 1903, where there was a hill and a good breeze. The first flight lasted 12 seconds, traveling 36 meters or 120 feet with Orville piloting. Three more flights were made on that day, with Wilbur achieving the best flight covering 255.6 meters or 852 feet in 59 seconds. The Wright brothers had made history with the first successful flight of a controllable, self-propelled, heavier-than-air machine. Over the next few years, the Wright brothers developed new flyers while remaining secretive in an attempt to secure patents and contracts. The Short Takeoff C-130 Hercules, Operation Credible Sport, 1980 through 1981. Lockheed's C-130 Hercules is one of, if not the most famous, transport planes used by the United States Armed Forces. Since it was first put into service in 1954, it has been used practically wherever American soldiers set foot. Made in more than 40 versions, the C-130 was used in a variety of roles, as a tactical airlifter, combat aircraft, for search and rescue missions, and in many other variants. In 1980, three C-130s were planned for modification in the most curious fashion in order to participate in the rescue of American hostages in Tehran. 
The project of adapting Hercules aircraft for the rescue mission was a desperate measure created by one of the greatest fiascos in the history of the U.S. Army. On November 4, 1979, supporters of the Iranian Revolution were protesting against the U.S. government's involvement into Iranian affairs and their refusal to extradite the former Iranian monarch Shah Reza Pahlavi. They had then captured 52 Americans and held them hostage for 444 days. This event, known as the Iran Hostage Crisis, was the beginning of the long-lasting hostility between the United States and Iran. On April 24 and 25, 1980, within Operation Eagle Claw, six C-130 planes and eight RH-53D Sea Stallion helicopters flew to Iran, carrying 133 men from Delta Force, U.S. Army Rangers and the CIA. They were supposed to participate in the rescue of the American hostages. This operation that started smoothly ended up being canceled as only five helicopters arrived in good condition at the Desert One improvised airfield in the Iranian desert. The debacle was complete when one of these crashed into a fully tanked C-130, causing a massive explosion that resulted in the death of eight men. The failure of Operation Eagle Claw urged the Office of the Secretary of Defense to establish an organization called the Joint Test Directorate, under the staff name Honey Badger, to find a new approach that was more likely to succeed. Out of the many projects on the table was a plan codenamed Operation Credible Sport, which seemed the most promising. The idea was for Delta Force to storm the U.S. Embassy in Tehran from the nearby Amjadian Stadium, from which they would be transferred by a C-130 Hercules. Once the Deltas rescued the hostages, they would lead them back to the stadium, where the same C-130 would take them to the security of a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. Using the C-130 for the operation was a logical choice, as the aircraft had a very large storage capacity, a much larger radius of operation than a helicopter, and was designed to land and take off from uneven terrain. The problem was that the C-130 needed at least 3,000 feet of runway, and the length of the stadium pitch was no more than 500 feet. Finally, the aircraft had to meet the requirements of landing on an aircraft carrier using the arresting cable system. These preconditions led to the extensive modification of the aircraft. The team assigned to the project in June 1980 consisted of specialists from Lockheed, the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Air Force. They were tasked with modifying the Hercules into a super-stall, short takeoff and landing aircraft, and the deadline was set in 90 days. The first idea was to use JATO, jet-assisted takeoff bottles, a concept that had been developing for some time in the Air Force. When a calculation was made that 58 large JATO bottles were needed for the modification, the team decided to switch to a lighter but more powerful solution, missile rockets. On August 19, 1980, the U.S. Air Force approved the modification of three C-130H airplanes from the 463rd Tactical Airlift Wing, tail number 74-1683, 74-1686, and 74-2065. What the team devised was to place the rocket on the specific spots on the fuselage in order to enhance the takeoffs as well as to reduce the stopping distance of the aircraft. Three types of rockets were used for the task. Mark 56 rockets, used for the RIM-162 Evolve Sea Sparrow missiles, AGM-45 Shrike rockets, and ASROC anti-submarine missile rockets. Eight ASROCs, four on each side of the fuselage, were mounted behind the cockpit and were pointed forward in order to stop the aircraft during the landing. Eight Mark 56 rockets were mounted on the aft rear fuselage area. Four rockets on each side had the task of assisting with the takeoff and were pointed rearward at a 45-degree angle. Eight Shrikes were mounted above the wheel wells and pointed downwards to break the plane's descent and soften the landing. Another four Shrikes were mounted on two wing pylons to secure the stability of the aircraft, as well as another two rockets in front of the beaver tail at the rear fuselage to prevent overyawing. Additional modifications included reinforcing the fuselage, installation of extra fins for better stability, and a tail hook on the bottom of the aircraft for landing on aircraft carriers. The modified C-130 was equipped with improved electronics that included terrain following and avoidance radar a GPS navigation system, and onboard computer that was supposed to control the rockets. In case of system failure, the computer had a manual backup. The first modified aircraft was number 74-1683, designated as the XFC-130H Superstall. It arrived in the test area at the Eglin Air Force Base on October 17th. After passing a number of initial tests on October 29th, it was ready for the full test, including both takeoff and landing. 
Lockheed's flight crew decided to use the manual system of rocket control. The takeoff was impeccable. Propelled by eight powerful Mark 56 rockets, the aircraft was airborne at only 150 feet after brake release. The flight went smoothly, and the crew turned the aircraft for a rocket-assisted landing. When the aircraft reached an altitude of 12 feet, the upper set of Ascroc set off. At that point, the aircraft unexpectedly lost speed. The flight engineer, completely blinded by the flare of the rockets, thought the aircraft had touched the runway and activated the lower set of Azrocs. While still in the air, the aircraft lost altitude and leaned towards the right side. The right wing broke off immediately upon impacting the ground and set the aircraft on fire. Luckily, the airfield rescue team extinguished the fire in a matter of seconds, saving most of the equipment and allowing the crew to exit the aircraft safely. The project was intended to continue as the second aircraft's modification was almost complete. For security reasons, 74-1683 was dismantled and buried on site. Only two days after the accident on October 31st, the Iranian government announced that they were accepting the Algerian proposal to end the hostage crisis. Newly elected U.S. President Ronald Reagan also decided to give way to diplomacy on solving the crisis. On January 19, 1981, the United States signed the Algeria Declaration Agreement with Iran that resulted in the release of all 52 hostages. Operation Credible Sport had been terminated. Modification of the second C-130 did continue under the cover operation of Credible Sport 2, but was eventually abandoned for financial reasons. Concorde Supersonic Passenger Jet Airliner Concorde was a cooperation project between the United Kingdom and France, who signed a treaty in 1962 to design and build a supersonic transport, inspired by Chuck Yeager's 1947 blast through the sound barrier. The USA and the Soviet Union also planned their own version of a supersonic transport in competition. Concorde made its first test flight on the 2nd of March 1969 from Toulouse, France, but it had been beaten two months before by the Soviet Tu-144, which also resembled the Concorde in appearance. On the 21st of January 1976, the first commercial flights began with Air France and British Airways. Concorde had a cruising speed of 2,179 kilometers or 1,354 miles per hour, which was Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. A New York to London flight would only take three hours, therefore making it much faster than a regular commercial flight. Eventually, flights would be limited between London, Paris, and New York due to the costs to operate Concorde. For example, the cost of a ticket in 1996 was $7,574 for London. Concorde measured nearly 204 feet, or 62.1 meters in length, with a wingspan of 83 feet, 8 inches, or 25.5 meters. This could change slightly when in flight due to the heat generation, and the aircraft was painted in a special reflective white paint to reduce the heat. The aircraft featured a droop nose, a design feature that was necessary, so the pilot's vision wasn't restricted during landing and takeoff because of its high angle of attack. On the 25th of July, 2000, a Concorde from Paris to New York crashed, killing all 109 people on board. The cause was a burst tire that ruptured a fuel tank, leading it to erupt into flames. Concorde would be retired in 2003 by Air France and British Airways due to financial losses. Because development was so costly, Concorde was not financially profitable. However, it ensured that Europe would be ahead in aerospace development. First World War Tech – Sopwith Camel The British Sopwith Camel was developed by the Sopwith Aviation Company as a successor to the Sopwith Pup, which had become outpaced by the new German fighters that emerged in the skies. While they looked the same in appearance, the Camel was more difficult to handle and dangerous to fly. The first flight of the Camel prototype was on the 22nd of December 1916, flown by Harry Hawker at Brooklyn's Weybridge, Surrey. The aircraft was powered by a 110 horsepower Clerget 97 engine and was armed with 2.303 Vickers type machine guns in front of the cockpit. Synchronized to fire forwards through the propeller via an interrupter gear, a hump protective covering over the guns gave the biplane its distinctive Camel name. 
The fighter had two main wings stacked one above the other, with the fuselage construction mainly consisting of a wooden frame covered in fabric and aluminium panels around the engine. The Royal Naval Air Service put the Sopwith Camel into combat service first in June 1917, and the Royal Flying Corps put the biplane into combat the month after. Many novices were killed while training to pilot the vehicle. The rotary effect of the engine meant that the Camel was awkward to fly when turning left, but was very fast when turning right. In the hands of a skilled pilot, however, it could be an effective machine, able to outmaneuver other enemy airplanes except for the Fokker DR-1 triplane. From mid-1918, during the German Spring Offensive, the Sopwith Camel was used as a ground attack aircraft. Along with other Allied aircraft, it would support the infantry's advance towards the German border, sometimes fitted out to carry 25-pound bombs to attack German strongholds. Some variants include the Comic Night Fighter, for night fighting duties. The TF-1, a trench fighter that had been fitted with armor for protection and machine guns angled downwards for ground attacks upon heavily defended enemy lines. And the 2F-1, for flying from the deck of ships, featuring a shorter wingspan, a Bentley engine, and an overwing Lewis gun. During its service in the First World War by the Allied forces, the Sopwith Camel was credited with 1,294 victories, averaging 76 kills a month. In total, 5,490 Sopwith Camels were built, and the last fighter was retired by the RAF in January 1920.